just been hearing. Can everybody hear me clearly? Um, X, queso, in-map, uh, most recently ring. These are examples of operating system tests. Methods to detect what operating system is running on a computer over the internet or on the same LAN from another computer by testing how it looks at the, um, at the network. Now that can mean looking at its TCP IP stack or its ICMP imp uh, implementation or maybe its services or its services pattern. There's, um, there's lots of ways to do that. Uh, up till now though, um, you have had to access these things in a tool, uh, such as the X tool, X probe 2 tool, uh, or Nmap, or Queso, or whatever, or Ring. I don't know if any, how many people have looked at Ring? Seen Ring? Okay, cool. Some. Now, to start with, um, is why you should not leave me in the middle of this thing. is uh, I'm going to show you uh, what I've been doing. This is a program that I've written using uh, my library. Now, um, right now the library works in C and Java. You're looking at Java because Java is easy to make a GUI in. Um, <laughs> what you see in the bottom right window is loads of modified versions of the InMap database and the Queso database. Uh, very soon, once I look at X Pro 2 and look at its database, since it's now on a file, um, they'll be in there too. It's a list of all the operating systems that you find um, in those databases. And then over here, you find little check boxes for the tests. So far in Java, I've implemented uh, the Mango Packet tests uh, of Inmap fame and of Queso fame. Um, and um, C, I've also done the X stuff. Um, next is going to be the T sequence test and ring. So let's see if I can get it to work the first time. All right, now, earlier you were mentioning, somebody here was mentioning the, uh, the fact that X probe 1 used a tree used a, uh, sent one packet, and then based on the tree that it had in its memory, would send the next packet based on the result of the first packet, and as a result would send a total less packets than, um, than in that what, or, or I think any other test at the time. Um, and as a result, it could limit the, the number of packets it sent, reducing its, its um, IDS profile, reducing, increasing speed, all these kind of things. So what if you could do the same thing with InMap? What if you could run InMap one step at a time and then use the results that you got back since InMap runs? InMap alone has the seven mango packet tests that you see there and a T-sequence test, which tests initial sequence numbers um, and a point reachable uh, UDP test. What if you could use those one at a time? Well, um, this program right here shows what happens if you do that. If I run the InMap 4 and the Queso 2 tests, the source port of 10,000, um, I hope this is open. I hope this is closed. Now, um, a lot of the values in the test are based on starting sequence number, and this allows you to play with that. Now, oh, no suitable device found. Damn. So I'm plugging your network cable cord. Um, I'm not going to belabor. <laughs> I'm not going to play with this too long. In fact, I'm going to move on now anyways. And I'll come back to that. Um, but that's the kind of thing that you can do. I'll just keep that up since I think it's cool. Um, that's the kind of thing you can do when you're able to access the tests in a systematic way. Um, so hopefully now you should be convinced that you might want to hear the rest of the presentation. And again, if you don't, feel free to leave. Um, 
especially since I know that some of you who <coughs> dream and pearl could be very upset with the fact that you're not getting pearl code right now. I understand. I feel your pain. Okay, another thing, the uh, TGZ on the Z CD is useless. Go to my website. <coughs> Alright, who is this code for? Well, the answer is kind of everybody. If you're a hacker, you want to be able to write a script that says, don't run my exploit on anything except an exploitable box. If you were able to detect that you could, you could sort out Windows 2000, uh, version this, rev this, with this service running, in this version, before you ran your tests, what you'd be able to do is have a mini um, vulnerability test right before you actually ran your exploit, which means that instead of like running a system where you scan the host, you figure out what operating system is running, you figure out what ports are open, you research what, what hacks are available, you could just run the hack and it would stop if it wasn't the right operating system. It would just not run. On the other hand, if you're writing a worm, I'm not recommending you write a worm, but if you're writing a worm, you might not want to scan Linux hosts over and over and over and over again like you've all seen in your logs. You might just want to scan Windows 2000 boxes. Well, by including all or a portion of an operating system fingerprinting library in your code, you can do that. White hats. The same reason that a black hat is interested in what operating system is running on your network, you should be interested in what operating system is running on your network. Vulnerabilities are based on operating system and service version. Not all versions are vulnerable. Sometimes it's all of BSD. Sometimes it's just FreeBSD. Sometimes it's just Linux. Sometimes it's just Linux 2.2. You care because you're, you're going to be able to get broken into based on what you're running on, uh, your, op on your network. Now, on the other hand, Besides from a security perspective, it would be nice for administrators to know what's running on their network. So these are just the reasons that you are interested in operating system fingerprinting. Um, Avery's talk is so deep that he just kind of goes into it and he doesn't realize, uh, I'm sorry, he doesn't talk to why people are enjoying his code. Most of the people who enjoy, who enjoy his code don't actually do bad things with it, I hope. Um, Okay, this is a deep knowledge track about beta code. If you're here expecting something you can go and then program in your application tomorrow, again, with the Pearl people, sorry. <laughs> Not gonna happen. Okay, why a library as opposed to a tool? Well, this way you can write things for yourself that are operating system sensitive. Let's say you don't want to write a hack. Maybe you want your web page to just be displayed for Windows 98. Or maybe you want your web page just to be displayed for Windows, as in all of them. Maybe you just want to be able to display one administrative home page for Windows, one for Linux, one for this. And you want that web page, hopefully we'll be, I'll, I'll be talking about like the Apache module and planning. You want that web page to be able to say, hey, I'm going to give you this content based on what you are. That would be a very, very convenient way to hand out patches. You could hand out exactly the patch that needs to be handed out to exactly the person that needs that patch. It means less clicks, which, which administrators of thousands of users love. So let's talk about the problems with tools, the problems with programs right now. There's a bunch of tests, right? Some of them are MAT tests, some of them are KSO tests, some of them are XPUB tests, some of them are uh, you know, ring, some of them are uh, service tests. Well, you have different algorithms that are using these things different, different ways. Algorithm A by uh, Afer and, and Fyodor is now using fuzzy. So it's the most sensitive and advanced algorithm out there. And that just uses a brute force. It runs all the tests all the time and can come back with pretty good results usually. So you've got some more advanced algorithms. Um, but at the same time, you want to be able to have more control over your algorithm. If you're programming, say, Nessus, you might want to do different things and test differently than you are if you're, if you're doing another scanner. If you're doing a uh, web page, for instance, you might want to scan another way. If you're on a friendly network and you're responsible for a network and you're scanning it, you definitely don't want to do uh, tests that are going to possibly hang up any operating systems. There are operating systems, older ones, that will hang up on different uh, versions of Nmap's test. It's just a version of a DOS. You run Nmap on it, and it turns it off. This is a bad thing. So you can have polite, you can have stealthy, things that don't get detected. All these algorithms, though, 
are meta tests. They're above the test level. They're not actually involved with the test themselves. They're above the test. And, and, and these kinds of algorithms have the problems that Avery was just talking about. When he was saying, uh, you know, how do you deal with the results if you're talking about a load balance test? How do you deal with the results if you're talking about this situation? How do you deal with the results in this situation, this situation? All that's dealing with interpreting the, resu interpreting the results of a test, which is a meta-level algorithm issue. So what I'm trying to do is provide a way for you to get very easy access to the tests themselves so you can do whatever you want on top with an algorithm. Okay, why not a library? Well, I'm always going to be playing catch up. I'm not going to be able to write new tests. I'm not going to be able to write, you know, zippy doo doo of things. Maybe someday, like, I'll be able to come up with something new. But in general, people like Aislinn, Fyodor, Fyodor, these are the people who are going to be writing the new tests. They're going to be coming up with new code. They're going to come up with new algorithms. They're going to be doing the new cool stuff. What's in the library is going to be the yesterday old stuff, but just in a way that you can access. Um, Right, and, and this is not going to be a tool. Like I'm never going to hand out something that's going to be particularly useful to you right now. If you're a script kitty, you're not going to get anything you can run on the command line. Okay, let's talk about a, little, a little bit about the background of operating system fingerprinting. The first grandfather of all fingerprintings is Queso. How many people have used or heard of Queso? How many of you like Queso? Okay, less. Uh, that's first generation. Why was it first generation? It was the first operating system fingerprinting code, and I'll talk about this a little later, to pull the database outside of the program itself so that the database of fingerprints and the logic to fingerprint them were separate. Okay, after that, we have the passive side, POF siphon, stuff that's looking at traffic doing fingerprinting. Now, right now, I'm not implementing these tests, and these will probably be the last tests that I use. And the reason is that they're not particularly useful for administrators. If you're interested in doing passive fingerprinting, usually um, you're going to be uh, a person who's interested in not being seen. The other case is when you're interested in seeing what traffic is going in out of your network. And in that case, I think the, fi the fingerprinting, passive fingerprinting stuff that's going to become available with Snort is going to be far better than what I could do real quick. So I'm going to focus on the left side of the map here. Um, so we have InMap. InMap is the the Seminole Operating System Fingerprinting. And the reason is, is it's the first to treat it as a real science. <coughs> Fyodor used uh, a statistical test. He used mangled packet tests. He used UDP tests. That's a pretty broad spectrum of ways to guess at operating systems um, to use in tests. And the other thing that he did that's very significant is that he, he tested lots and lots and lots of operating systems. If you've got OpenBSD running on a little Macintosh like they had last year here, you might be able to get in that to pick it up. Um, you never know what's going to be in a database, though, and that's, that's a complaint um, that people like Acer have been pointing out, is that that database is so huge that it really is becoming unmanageable and kind of useless, like what he was talking about for the printers. I mean, it's very difficult when you've got 20 signatures, 10 signatures for HP printers, and they all come up. That's just not useful. Okay, second generation is X. X was the first test to use, um, to not send all the packets at once. It made decisions based on previous tests um, about what test to do next. The problem with that is it was static. That means that the, that the, that the tree was hard-coded. Um, so you had the tests, and then you had the tree, um, but just like the early versions of fingerprinting software had both tests and algorithm inside the code, uh, the, the tree and the, the tests both need to be outside the code. So the algorithm for choosing what tests to do when and the, um, and the tests themselves need to be configurable. Um, so that makes it a second generation. Now third generation is like probe 2, which I didn't know a whole lot about until today. So that, that code is addressing a lot of the problems um, with X, which is making it the most advanced fingerprinting system available. Now, once he does all the things that he's planning to do, it will probably be uh, cream of the crop. It will be the tool you want to use because it will probably incorporate a lot of a lot of the tests that InMap is using, the T-sequence test, these kinds of things. Hopefully, what I'll be able to do uh, is look at their API, the one that he was just describing, and use my library to code, te to code tests for his API, which means the fact that I finished the queso and InMap tests and made them separate, pulled them out, and done all that work, 
Well, Mina, he's kind of handed that on a silver platter, but we haven't talked about it, so um, that's up in the air. Um, okay, the other thing is a wing. Now, the one unique thing about T-sequence tests and in-map was that it was totally um, normal traffic. What it did is it sent, um, sent a packet, send packet. How many people understand the TCP handshake? If you don't understand the TCP handshake, what I'm going to say right now is going to be just like gobbledygook. We have gosh, it's gravity, right? So just forget it if you don't understand that. You send a send, send, send packet with a sequence number. It's going to respond back with a send ACK, with a send value in its, um, in its packet that corresponds in some way to the value that you sent. Now, by doing that over and over and over again, you can get um, a statistical relationship between what you send and what you get back. So you can find out if they're generating these sequence numbers, the ones that come in response randomly, or they're adding something to your sequence number. Very common is to add 100 bytes or add the value of 800 or some other constant. But there's no way to detect that. That will slip through a firewall as long as you've got a, um, a website running. That's it. All the firewalls, you'll be able to get that test through. So the T-sequence test is unique because it's extremely stealthy. It uses normal traffic. It's not doing anything illegal at all. If you stop T-sequence test, you stop your web server. That's the only way to stop that test. It, it's normal TCP traffic. Now the other thing that's normal TCP tra traffic is ring. And the way ring works is that when you send out a send packet and then they send back a response and then you do nothing, they're going to try to repair that connection. Like it's supposed to be, you talk, I talk, you talk, I talk, okay, we're talking. That kind of thing. Well, instead I go, I talk, and they go, we talk, and then you go, and then you say, they're going to say, we talk, we talk, we talk, and that, and, and the periods between the we talks is something that's constant per TCP IP stack implementation, which means you can test for it, which means, um, you can determine which operating system is running. Now, what's the significant thing about that? It's very much like it, FIDOR's, FIDOR MAP, FIDOR, FIDOR MAP's T sequence test in that it uses totally normal traffic. It's not something you can detect with an IDS system. It's the same from an IDS perspective as someone unplugging their Ethernet cord or a host going down. The number of false positives you get by writing an IDS signature for that kind of a test would be phenomenal. So both the T-sequence test and the um, ring test represent uh, methods for, um, for getting, getting an operating system in a very stealthy way. Good. We're talking about Queso again. Um, if you want to know about Queso, read Fyodor's paper. In fact, if you want to know about operating system fingerprinting, read Fyodor in that Fyodor's paper. That's the seminal work in the field. It's the first real scientific look at it. Now, if you really want to know about operating system, then read Aether's X paper. It's that thick, and, and you'll know a lot more. But if you want to start out, if you want to review these concepts, uh, Fido's paper is a great place to start. Uh, MMAP, exactly what I just said. Robust database, really big, and it's the first to be really scientific and really systematic about the way you fingerprint. Um, X. First use intelligence. It's all IP, but it's got a hard-coded algorithm for determining what tree it is. Ring, we just talked about it. X2, you know as much as me. All the stuff that you just said, that's what X2 is. Can everybody hear me still? Cool. Okay, let's talk about the structure of my library. All the tests right now are actually written in C. Now, the reason that that's the case is that C has the best and most documented method for accessing raw IP sockets. Most of the tests, many of the tests, involve writing packets in very specific and non-usual ways. So you need to have access to that raw, uh, those raw libraries. The other thing is that I use LibNet, the beta version, because it's cool and does things for me that I don't, ha I don't have to sort things out because I use it. It's got a lot of functionality. It's really cool. So that's in, C, that's in C2. The other thing is that actually running the tests is irrelevant. The important thing is you have that information from somewhere. So the easiest way to write the test in C, so that's how I did. Um, okay, C applications, Java applications, C++, Perl applications across the top there. Um, and then beneath those, you have a C library, Java library, C++ library, and Perl library. The Java library is the one, one that's most robust, obviously, because that's the one that I just showed you. Um, so right now, I'm going for implementing X, KSO, NMAP, 
and Ring and all these different tests and having them move up in between these different programming languages. So wouldn't it be cool if you could write a Perl script that says, if Windows do this, or if some function returns as Windows, do this, or if some function returns as Windows 2000, you do this. This would be a good thing. The other thing with Perl, and this is something that actually I'd love to get this functionality from Perl into other uh, languages once I get done, is you, is you can take it at a look at um, Rainforest Poppy's LibWhisker. LibWhisker is capable of doing very, very accurate fingerprinting of the, the web port. It can sort out what um, <coughs> what server, what web server is running on a particular computer. I was doing a pen test recently, and they were using a, a FreeBSD, it was a product that was based on FreeBSD, and they were using it to proxy a web, uh, a, a, an MT2000 web server. Well, when when Wisco first went into it, it said, oh, it's reporting back, it's saying to you it's Windows 2000. So that's what it is initially. And then it runs a bunch of other tests and finds that the actual behavior of the server is more like FreeBSD. So it comes back and says, actually, no, this is Apache. This is Apache. It looked like Windows 2000 at the beginning, but it's really Apache. Wouldn't it be neat if you could get uh, the, this is what the web server really is from Lou Whisker and move it over and make decisions based on that in other programming languages. So you could say, because Apache, for instance, runs on Windows 2000. Rarely do people do that, but it does, it runs. So you can get that legitimate header back from, from that web server. And then if you're running IIS hacks against that box, why? So, uh, being able to say, for instance, run a T-sequence test against port 80, get a sequence number, run a ring test against port 80, those are both totally stealthy, and then just ask for what, what um, do a service test to find out what, um, what web server is running, you'd be able to fingerprint a host with absolutely no IDS detectable stuff. All that stuff is totally legitimate traffic, and it would tell you a lot of information. So every operating, every language here has different uh, different advantages. The reason I did Java first is because most of what I want to focus on is how OOP and object-oriented programming really affects um, the fingerprinting science. And Java is very it's very easy to get threads and OOP out of Java. So um, I started there, and then I'll use what I've learned there to do the other ones. So everyone kind of understand what, what I'm talking about here. I, have I lost everyone? Have I not lost everyone? Okay. Okay, right now, for my .c files, each test is written as a listen function and as a uh, send function. Now, for instance, the sending portion of uh, in that T1 through T7 are very different, but the fingerprinting portion are all identical, so you can collapse the listening file into one. Um, so basically, from a C perspective, it's functional programming. By using my C library, you should be able to just call functions with the right, right stuff and run whatever test you want. Um, let's take a look at the C code. Talk amongst yourselves. In a moment, all of my code is released in GNU. Uh, so you can use it to load, load, testing. Testing. Okay, it's back on. Um, Can you hear me now? 
So you have a function call, it takes a source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port, and an initial sequence number. Now, in C++ or Java, what you can do is overload these functions so that you don't actually have to give it a sequence number. You don't even have to give it a source port number. Basically, the source port by in, in the in-map meta-level algorithm is chosen for you. It's chosen randomly. But you don't have to do it that way. If you want to, you can configure just about everything. On the other hand, the overloaded functions will allow you to run it the same way that in-map does. So if you just want to have a, a, destination, a, a destination IP, assuming you're using your own IP so you don't need a source IP, assuming that you're going to generate a source port randomly so you don't need a source port, and you need a destination port, you don't need a sequence number because it's going to choose that randomly, <coughs> then that function will just have destination port, destination IP. You do your build the options. In that TCP test, you use crazy options. Um, it's one of the IDS signatures of the, of the tests. Anytime you see this particular set of options all together in one place in a packet, it's usually an in-map test. Then you set up the, uh, the build TCP port of it, portion of it. I don't know how many of you are familiar with LibNet. And you use the SIN port and the bogus port here. There are so many flags in, uh, that a TCP packet can have. Uh, there is one that is not defined. That's a bogus. Uh, in that sets that flag, most TCP IP implementations have no idea what to do with it. So they can, they'll respond back. Sometimes an operating system will, read, will take the packet that it's reading in, change it into the response which means they don't actually like, write a new packet. If they do that, then the bogus flag in the, in the, in the packet that comes back will also be set. So depend, again, depending on how you implement it, the results are different. You make enough space in the IP and then you send the test. Moving back to my PowerPoint, talk amongst yourselves. Okay, here is something that I would actually like some feedback from people at this conference about. And the question is, how do you classify an operating system? For instance, the way I'm doing it right now is with OS family name, major version, minor version, other information, and architecture. I know for a fact that this is not a good way to do it. And the reason is, is think about how many BSD variants there are. If you have a family and you want to be, you want to be able to write a test that's for all BSD, or you want to be able to write an exploit that's for all BSD boxes, if you're doing that, you want to say, if the family name, if this top level group is BSD, then run the test. If not, then don't run the test or the exploit. Okay, if you do that, then what goes in major versions, since that's the next test down, would be free BSD. And then under that would be four point something. Well, the problem is it just doesn't split up very well. Like, for instance, Windows. Windows is the family name. Then you have 98 and all these other things. So when you're using Windows and the major version is 98, that's co comparable to like the entire operating system of FreeBSD. Uh, probably shouldn't be. So how do you classify uh, an operating system? How do you group them? That's a difficult question, and it really takes some knowledge of operating system history, of which I unfortunately know only a lot of part. Um, so I'd like some discussion, perhaps, if you'd like to come talk to me about this afterwards, please do. Uh, but every class JLS test, which every test is a um, subclass of, has these, this information in it. Not only that, it has, um, again, if you don't know Java, then this is going to sound irrelevant to you, so just ignore it. Um, I've redone the equivalency stuff so that it, 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 it does it does the equivalency in such a way that it will order any given set of these operating systems by their actual classification. So it'll take OS family name into account first, then major version, then minor version, then something like this, so that you can do uh, you can use the Java the actual Java comparative function, and it'll actually return a uh, a negative or positive number based on the relationship between two operating systems. Which means you can uh, you can for a given operating system you can. Uh, you can run tests um, based on 
less or more stuff. Um, if you know Java, then perhaps you know what I mean. If not, perhaps you know what I mean. <coughs> okay. Okay, threading. Operating system fingerprinting should be threaded. And the reason is, is that there are some tests that are related to each other. For instance, that tree that X did. But there are other tests that are totally irrelevant. So you could be running the X tree, all those ICMP tests, at the same time you're running in-map tests, at the same time you're running service tests. And then the whole time you could be using, um, you know, race condition safe data objects to, um, to move information about what tests should be run. So you can have, basically what this, what this allows you to do is write testing algorithms that will turn on its head based on the results of a, a one test. It, may, it means that you can write dynamic trees. So you can say, well, let's start running these four tests and then get those four tests back and as a result run total different other set of tests. Now the reason that's important is that one of the problems with in-maps uh, fingerprinting and just, just it just vulnerability assessment in general is that it tends to be slow. Um, it takes a long time to do this. So if you can do stuff in parallel, if you can get information in, in different directions at the same time, that gives you a huge advantage. Okay, you've already looked at the code. Let's see. Pro module and C++ module will happen someday. If you're a pro guy and you love writing modules that access C libraries and move like large amounts of data back and forth, please come talk to me. I'd love to have your help. Um, C++ I think I'll be able to handle just because uh, it's easy. Okay, what's the future of my fingerprinting library? Well, obviously it's to implement all the tests. Like when you're able to access all the tests in my library in one place, even if that's all I give you, that means that it's, it's, it's an easy place for you to start assuming you want to write operating system, system fingerprinting code. Um, the other thing is service fingerprinting. There's a program called Win Fingerprint that does nothing but fingerprint all of those dangerous, turn them off please, 130x uh, Windows ports that you should never be using, ever. Um, so you can run an entire sequence of service testing to fingerprint um, what NetBIOS, what SMB, all those things, what they're doing, what they mean. The stuff that they can return, I haven't looked at the code carefully, it looks like it's pretty impressive, very much like uh, LibWhisker's HTTP ability. And as a result, if you can get that service information, then what you can do is you can have associations between service generations, like SendMail version this goes with Solaris version this, and IIS version this goes with Windows version this. Like some of these things you happen to know off the top of your head. Some of them on the other hand are a little more complicated. But since vulnerabilities are based on service member and operating system member, it would be nice to be able to use service to get operating system member guesses and use uh, operating system guesses to get service member guesses. So hopefully we'll be developing a database about what services go with what operating systems. I'm sure somebody's done that. So it wouldn't be hard. The other thing is that what you can get if you have all of this stuff is a CVE database, kind of a Nessus Lite. Nessus actually tests to figure out whether or not you're vulnerable. What if you don't care? What if you don't really care if you're vulnerable or not? What if you're running a version of Windows blah 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 or FreeBSD blah 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 that's vulnerable to five things? Well, maybe all you care about is that you need to upgrade the next version. Maybe you're on FreeBSD 4.0 and you need to be on 4.0.1. Maybe you're on Windows 2000 and you really should be on Windows XP. If that's all you care about and you're an administrator, you don't need to have a full-blown vulnerability test to make sure you are, in fact, vulnerable to something. All you need to know is, not current version, please patch. That's it. So if you can, if you can be very aware of operating system fingerprints and service fingerprints, you get a very, very cheap, very, very fast vulnerability scanner. Um, the other thing is to develop a simple scanner. Something that does, I don't know, a quarter of what MAP does. <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys have looked at MAP 3. Uh, it's up on insecure.org. You definitely ought to go take a look. Uh, the Windows versions of, of MAP and, and the Unix versions are merged. It's pretty cool. Um, 
but that's, I definitely don't want to write stuff that competes with these tools that are out there because they're so good that it's very unlikely that I'll ever be able to generate something that's going to be able to keep pace with those technological developments. Rather, I prefer to kind of imitate what they did last week. I think the coolest thing would be a little less Apache module so that you could give different information to different web, to different users based on their operating system. So you set your proxy up so that, let's say, you, you do you combine your CD database scanner and your little less Apache model, you scan your network, you come up with uh, 192.168.1.5 is a vulnerable version of FreeBSD. You associate, you put the patch up on a web server, and you say, if FreeBSD version this, show this page. And then you write into your proxy for your web surfing that they have to go to the, to the, to the patch version update page first. Well, that means that you scan your network for all the vulnerable things, you put the patches that they need up on the website, and then those servers or workstations that are vulnerable will automatically be forced to go download the patches before they can go continue surfing. Now, they might not install the patches, but at least they download it, and that's a start. You cannot lead. <coughs> you cannot make a horse drink. Okay, that's everything. Uh, thank you, and do you have any questions? Yes, oh, and actually I'm going to have to do microphone switching since nobody can hear. So if you'll just come up. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a very good question. And it's on the HTML documentation that's inside the CD. It's www.sincere.net. S-Y-N-S-E-E-R. Good point. Next question. Next question. Can't hear a word you're saying. That would be a good idea. Um, yes. But you asked TCL, and I said yes. Anybody else? Okay, I officially am relinquishing the mic microphone. Please feel free to come up and do the one-on-one -on -one questions if you feel like it. Bye-bye now. <laughs>